Welcome to the Writer's Edge Podcast, a platform to share conversations about the health and wellness of horse and rider. I'm your host, Farley Schweigert. Hey y'all, it's Farley with the Writer's Edge Podcast. And today we're going to have a conversation about equine gastric ulcers with Dr. Katie Young from Kentucky Equine Research. We're going to talk about what gastric ulcers are, how to recognize them in your horse, treatments, and management tips. Welcome, Dr. Young. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. Well, thanks. It is great to be here. I appreciate you asking me. So did you want to... So give a little background on me. So yes, people... so kind of kind of one of the things here is I feel like people do, are the best authors of their story. So give us a little background <laughs> about you, and um, and fill us in on all things Dr. Young. Well, okay then. Um, I'm I've been a horse person since I was a kid, and as many many equine nutritionists have as a background plan was to go to vet school. And then as an undergrad, I started thinking about vet school. It came time to apply for vet school. And I thought, you know, I think I want to go to grad school. So I got my undergraduate degree in biology with uh, minors in chemistry and animal science, and then went to grad school at Texas A&M and got, uh, earned my PhD in equine nutrition and exercise physiology. And my research was based on mineral requirements and mineral balance in resting and exercising horses. And I did a project on copper and zinc, and I did a project, I did several projects on electrolytes in working horses. So that's, that's my educational background. When I finished at A&M, I stayed for a few years on the faculty. And then Actually, my major professor kind of kicked me out and said, you, you need to go out in the real world. And uh, I, I went to work for a regional feed manufacturer in Kansas City that uh, is, is no longer, it's, it went bankrupt. And from there, I started as an independent contractor and was a contractor for several years with a national feed company and then was hired by them. And then we parted ways a few years ago, and I've been working as a consulting equine nutritionist with Kentucky Equine Research, as well as I do some consulting uh, with veterinarians and with horse owners. And along with that, uh, I also, I I ride my own horses. I am primarily now an eventer. I did hunter jump. I started out barrel racing, then I went into hunter jumpers did that for many years. And then now that I've got back problems and knee problems and not as great eyes and all these things are falling apart. So I made the logical progression to eventing. So (laughs) that's what I'm doing now. And, and I also do some training and I do writing lessons. I've been giving writing lessons and training for years on the side, kind of, because that's a nice way to stay up to date in the horse industry. So that is my background, and uh, I've actually done quite a lot in uh, my previous position, and now working with KER and consulting with veterinarians, I've done a lot of consulting on equine gastric ulcers. So I am which is, so excited to talk about this today. <laughs> so excited. Well, and you know, it's funny when I was a kid, it, it was not even a thing. You know, nobody even considered gastric ulcers. And there are so many times these days that you know, somebody asks me about their horse and some issues they're having with their horse. And one of the first things, have you talked to your vet about gastric ulcers? And, you, oh, didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, we had a, when I was a kid, we had a vet move in and um, he started diagnosing a lot of abscesses. And I remember my dad saying, we're not going to have a whole barn full of abscesses just because this vet got here and <laughs> now we're diagnosed with abscesses. And then, yep. and then ulcers came along <laughs> and he was like, and, and we, we worked real hard, you know, to read the signs about the nutrition and things. And we're like, 
and we're not going to have a lot of gastric ulcer problems because that's a thing now. <laughs> well, that's not exactly how that works either because yeah. even though, I mean, and this is why I sought you out is because even though I think I have a knowledge of it and I, and I have a base knowledge of it, I've had some new issues crop up. And, and so I'm like, let's have a conversation about it. Um, oh, definitely. It's a, it, it, it can be a thing in all sorts of areas of issues with your horses. Absolutely. And one of the first things I want to just in case somebody wants to read more about gastric ulcers and um, there, there are some good references and what is the pro you know, you get on the internet and <laughs> you can find, you can find anything you want on the internet. And so if you have an opinion, you can find something on the internet that will substantiate your opinion, whether that's based in facts or not. So just some, some good places to go. Um, KER does a lot of really good, solid research. So the KER website has a lot of articles available on all sorts of different things. But just in kind of making sure I was up to speed on gastric ulcers when I, of course, I do as everybody does, and I go to Dr. Google. But there is uh, the AAEP, uh, the... American Association of Equine Practitioners. That's that's a good solid website that you know, that that is for veterinarians. So when you go to AAP, you know you're you're getting something with good science basics, and that's what you want when you're looking up these things. Again, KER is great with that, but I did find a nice review article uh, by Frank Andrews, Dr. Frank Andrews, who's a, a veterinarian who's done a lot of work with gastric ulcers. And he, there's, there's a nice review article, equine gastric ulcer syn syndrome on the AAP website. So if, if somebody wants to go back and look up more of the science, that that's a real good reference article. Well, and, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, living in a post 2020 world, um, and, have, and everybody having to learn what real science is and, and what pseudoscience yeah. is, you know, it's good to continue to put out those um, um, places on the internet that ha stand for real science and, and will provide that. And, and that's what yeah. I enjoy working with KER about is that you guys do so much research and, and so grounded in the science of things. And, uh, and the AAEP is always a, a solid source um, right. for, for anything uh, horse related. So yes, yeah, so thank you for, for that as, sure. we're, as we're navigating the, <laughs> the, the interwebs <laughs> in a post 2020 uh, yes. world. <laughs> Good times, yep. <laughs> so Dr. Young, let's kind of start, let's just start okay. at the beginning on okay. what it is and we'll yep. go from there. What, what are equine gastric ulcers and why do horses get them? Um, so the, to understand why horses get gastric ulcers, which are gastric ulcers in particular are lesions in the horse's stomach. Okay, there are also horses can get ulcers in their hind gut but that's kind of a, an entirely different topic and some similar symptoms, but diagnosis is different and some of the management is different. So we're really gonna look at the gastric ulcers. And the reason, number one reason why they weren't diagnosed years ago was because the only true diagnosis for gastric ulcers is endoscopy. When the, the veterinarian runs a tube with a camera down the horse's esophagus into the stomach and looks for these lesions. And so, of course, years ago, they didn't have that capability. So, you could, you know, people just didn't even realize. But now, now that we can see them and understand a lot more about the anatomy and the physiology of the horse's stomach, it makes sense why horses tend to get gastric ulcers. So horses stomachs are divided into two portions. There's an upper portion of the stomach and there's a lower portion. And in the horse's stomach, 
there are digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid, and those are the major methods that digestion takes place in the horse's stomach. Now, in the lower portion of the stomach, which is called the glandular portion, there are actual glands, which is why it's called glandular, and those are, those are the glands that secrete the hydrochloric acid, as well as there are glands that secrete uh, basically a mucus type material that lines that, that lower portion of the stomach and protects it from the hydrochloric acid. Because you know we all know uh, if you get really strong acid, it will burn through flesh. So you've got the mucus that protects the lower portion of the stomach, but the upper portion of the stomach does not have those glands. And now there are no acid secreting glands, but there are also no mucus secreting glands. So the, the lower part of the stomach has this acid protected, but when the horse exercises, when the horse is stressed, there are times that that acid can be splashed up on the upper portion of, of the stomach, which causes lesions. So that's, that's one of the primary theories and methods of how a horse gets gastric ulcers. Now they can actually get gastric ulcers in the lower, the glandular portion of the stomach as well. Those ulcers are not as well understood that those could be uh, bacterial in origin, or I mean, it's, it's, it's possible that there is an area that's not as well protected and, not, and the acid might have a, have a role there. But usually we're looking at the lesions that are on the a glandular and non glandular portion of the stomach. Uh, there are many times in, in the horse's day that the acid is buffered. So it is not the, the liquid in the stomach is not as highly acidic. For instance, when the horse eats, and as I'm sure most viewers realize, horses tend to have food in nature in their stomach all the time. They're grazers, little bits of, of forage, you know, almost all the time. So when there is food in the stomach, that helps buffer. As the horse uh, chews and salivates and swallows, the saliva has bicarbonate, so it buffers. It's a natural buffer. Uh, forages themselves will buffer. But there are times, and, and these days, how many people have horses that aren't out on pasture or don't have hay in front of them 24 seven and maybe get two meals a day. And so there's long periods of time that there is not any food in the stomach or any saliva in the stomach to buffer. And the acid can get very strong. And then if the horse is stressed or the horse is exercising and you get acid splashing, they're very prone to developing gastric ulcers. So uh, that's, is that, does that pretty well explain why they tend to get ulcers? Absolutely. My one follow-up question, can you, can your vet diagnose whether, um, if the ulcers are, obviously we've been talking more about them being in the upper aspect of the, of the stomach, but can, can they diagnose if they are those in the glandular aspect? Um, Absolutely. Okay. Yep. The, the, the scope can see the entire, they can see the entire stomach. Okay. And I will say even, even with great big horses, uh, I, I used to spend time working with the Budweiser Clydesdales and I was there when they were getting scoped for gastric ulcers and they actually, um, the veterinarian had to have a long endoscope, a, a typical length of endoscope did not get into the entire Clydesdale stomach, but there are scopes available that will even look at great big draft horses. Now, the problem is they can't get beyond the stomach. So sure. when we start talking about hindgut ulcers, there's really no way to look. Yes. So I already, I already feel that we're going to do another conversation about hindgut ulcers <laughs> in the future. <laughs> so that, that works. So, but yes. And when you, when you do have your horse scoped, uh, you you will get 
a report from your veterinarian that should separate the, the glandular from the non-glandular ulcers and give you a score that gives you an idea of how severe the ulcers are. And so, yeah, they can, they can do a nice job of really looking and seeing exactly what's going on. But there are also, uh, there's a lot of symptoms. There's a lot of signs that can lead you to think, hmm, wonder if I'm dealing with a, a gastric ulcer issue that, you know, because in general, you're not just going to have a, the, the vet come and scope for no good reason. Right, right. So, let's, so let's, yeah, let's talk about some of these symptoms and and kind of kind of go. Let's go down that rabbit trail for a little bit. <laughs> oh man, yeah. How 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 to recognize? Yes. That, uh, one of the first things uh, that that makes me think, oh, gastric ulcers, is if your horse changes its behavior. For instance, you've had a horse that's never had an issue and becomes girthy. You know, you're tightening the, the girth or the cinch and the horse starts pinning their ears and saying, oh, I'm not happy with that. So that can be a symptom. I mean, that can be a symptom of poor saddle fit and lots of other things. But you look at that and say, okay, um, now let's, is, is there anything else that might be a symptom? If they go off feed, poor appetite, they don't usually have a poor appetite, that can be a symptom. Uh, if they're just picky about what they eat and, and start, you know, you've got a horse that'll eat anything and then they say, ah, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to eat that. If they start, if it gets harder to keep, maintain body weight and body condition. So if you've got a horse that tends to be a poor keeper and, you know, you might talk with a nutritionist or the vet as a nutritionist, I will look and, and evaluate the entire diet and say, okay, that horse is getting enough calories to meet their needs. They're truly getting enough calories. So there's something else going on. Could be gastric ulcers. Again, there's a lot of other things, but that's something to look at. Uh, if, if they suddenly start losing weight, uh, chronic diarrhea, sometimes it's just a hair coat. You know, if they, if, if you've got a horse that you just can't get that shine on the hair. It's kind of rough. That can be a symptom of gastric, gastric ulcers. Grinding teeth is often an indication of pain. So could be gastric ulcers. Sometimes just behavioral changes. Uh, you got a good, good natured, happy horse and it starts getting cranky. You know, especially if, if you've got a mare, a lot of times we start looking saying, oh, you know, just, she's just being a cranky mare. Well, maybe she's not. Maybe there's something painful going on. She's trying to tell us that there's something going on. Sometimes horses that uh, are nervous, it can be a change that they didn't used to be. And now they tend to be real reactive or sometimes just a horse that as long as you've known it has been kind of reactive kind of take a look around and say, huh, are there any other symptoms that perhaps, again, we're looking at gastric ulcers. Sometimes a uh, colic can be associated, either a uh, chronic subacute colic, or if you just have a, a sudden acute colic, that may be a horse that's developed gastric ulcers. And sometimes it's just poor performance. You just, you can't get, maybe your horse used to be able to perform at this level, and now they're just backing off. You can't get as hard a run there. You don't get as nice of a, of a hunt around. They're just, they're swishing their tail. They're just a little unhappy. Those, those are all signs, potential signs of gastric ulcers. And that's, I mean, that's across the board. Like that's, that's what makes this so difficult. Um, yep. On, <laughs> on absolutely me, because that whole list, um, can be gastric ulcers, can be this, can be that, can, you know, can be cranky, yeah. man, can be poor saddle fit, you know, and it's, it's really being an astute horseman on and, and ruling yeah. out what you can and, and then and the, down the road. The, cause a, a lot of those symptoms are just the horse is trying to tell you something's wrong. And you just got to be aware and know your horse and say, you know, something's off. And then you start going through the process of elimination, uh, girthiness. Okay. Have you, have you had a saddle fitter? 
go through one by one and rule rule things out. But if you have several of those symptoms together, and of course, always I recommend consulting with your veterinarian if you're if you're seeing those symptoms. But some of them are um, fairly indicative of gastric ulcers, especially when you put several together. You've got teeth grinding. Uh, you've got cinchy, uh, a cinchy horse. Um, they're they're crankier than they used to be. All of those are going. Hmm. Yeah, let's have the vet out and get them scoped. Do you find a correlation with cribbers and gastric ulcers? Can be because cribbing can be, uh, especially in young in, in young horses, because babies are very prone to gastric ulcers. And what they're finding is a lot of times with babies, if they start cribbing, that may very well be a symptom of gastric ulcers. So... <laughs> it's, it's, and, the, and the hard thing too is some horses are so stoic mm -hmm. that you don't even know mm -hmm. so and in that situation they may not be showing any signs of pain they just it, they just may be harder keepers and you're going okay why am I not being able to get weight on this horse or just again their hair coat doesn't look quite as as nice as you think it ought to mm -hmm. So it's just, it's something to be aware of all, all of the potential symptoms. And then the next thing, when, when you're seeing these symptoms, then you, then you start looking at, okay, the risk factors. So along with some of these symptoms, do I also have some high risk factors? And there's, there are a lot of environment and stress related risk factors, and there are also management risk factors. So if we look at environment, uh, one of the things that can really precipitate gastric ulcers is a, a change in their exercise level. Like a horse has been off and then you put them back into work. And if you don't bring them gradually back into work, that can precipitate gastric ulcers. Uh, performance in racing horses tend to have gastric ulcers. A lot of times th those are very stressful environments, especially if, if they're being hauled down the road a lot. Sure. That physically is very hard on the horse. And actually, emotionally, it can be very hard on the horse. And horses under stress tend to develop more gastric ulcers. Uh, just a hectic training environment can be more stressful. Um, uh, horses that tend to be kind of uh, nervous and reactive, those, those are horses that I look at and say, you know, that's a horse that is... is the type that is seems to especially be prone to gastric ulcers. That is not to say that really calm, placid horses can't get gastric ulcers because they can, but if they tend to be nervous and react to their environment and react to stress, that certainly seems to be a predisposing factor. Just hauling horses, there's been some research in just flat putting them in a trailer and hauling them, especially on an empty stomach, that can increase risk of gastric ulcers. Uh, horses that don't get turnout. Turnout is a, tends to be a really good thing for gastric ulcers. It's not 100%. There's been some research. There was a research project done several years ago that they were looking at different uh, feeding management programs to see if one would be better than another for gastric ulcers. And between they did a switchback experiment. So uh, each horse got both diets and during the crossover period, just to, 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 to get them in between one diet to the next and give them a time to basically, you know, clean out and get back to normal. They turned them out on pasture and they had horses that developed more gastric ulcers just out on pasture. So it's not a hundred percent that, turnout is going to be the magical cure for ulcers, but lack of turnout certainly does uh, increase the risk. Lack of direct contact with other horses. Horses are social animals. They're herd animals. They like to be around other horses. So a lot of times you think about it, if you see, if you're driving down the road and there's a pasture with one horse in it, how often do you see that horse pass, pacing the fence? and yelling and yeah, they, that is stressful and that can increase risk of gastric ulcers. Uh, thoroughbreds tend to 
if, if you've got a thoroughbred, then I tend to always suspect gastric ulcers. That tends to be a reactive breed and they seem to be very susceptible to gastric ulcers. And then another big risk factor is a previous diagnosis of gastric ulcers. If your horse has already had gastric ulcers, then they tend to be more, more prone to develop them again in the future. So those are kind of the environmental risk factors. And then there are management and diet related risk factors. So at this point, is everybody going, oh my Lord, why do I have horses? <laughs> They're all going to have gastric ulcers. I know. I know I am because I'm sitting here going, yep, yep, yep. Even though I thought I was managing this right, I was managing this right. Because uh, uh, my barn's a barn full of stall rest right now between, I've got a bunch of orthopedic injuries right now. So of course that's a. Oh uh, yeah, that's hard. Um, and, and that's super hard, but I, I mean, even going back to some of the symptoms, I, my horse's coat, even though we're still in the middle of winter is duller than it should be. And I'm going, <laughs> thought I had this. And this is why we're talking <laughs> about this today. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so we, but we, we will get to some management tips on how to reduce the risk of gastric ulcers because you can. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, so, I just, Dr. Young, I just think this is great because having this conversation and, and you're laying this out so well um, that, you know, the audience can sit there and listen and go, okay, yes, that makes sense. And I need to, I need to, it's in a, con, uh, a nice organized way that I, I can listen to it and, and reflect on what my own practices are with my horses yeah. right now. So no, this is, this is great. Okay. Well, and then just getting into the, the diet and nutrition related risk factors. And this is kind of going along with lack of turnout, um, lack, lack of forage, whether that forage is pasture. I mean, pasture is wonderful. A lot of us don't have, you know, pasture access. So um, in that case, making sure that there's hay available. Because again, they're designed for small bits of forage going through the gut all the time. And the further you get from mother nature in management, the more risk there is of having something gut related go wrong. So as much as you can mimic mother nature, that, that tends to be a good way to look at it. So, and along with that fasting. So if you've got a long period of time that there is nothing in the gut, you're increasing the risk of gastric ulcers. I know that the, the barn where I keep my horses, uh, I'm very lucky that they make their own hay. So they don't mind that when I go out in the evening, I say, huh, there's not quite enough here. They've been eating a lot. There's not enough for them to go through the night. So I chunk them some more hay. But you don't want as much as possible. You don't want long periods of fasting. Uh, you, if you've got a horse that's prone to gastric ulcers, soluble carbohydrates, starch and sugar, can exacerbate those ulcers. So if you have a horse that tends to gastric ulcers, you don't want to feed large meals of high sugar starch. So that's not, I don't want to get people scared of sugar and starch because there's a, there's a massive movement these days of let's not feed our horses soluble carbs. And that's really not a good answer because horses need soluble carbs, but not big meals of high sugar starch. Like don't, don't feed your horse a big meal of straight corn. That's a lot of starch. Right. And so, I think that probably speaks more to breaking it up into a, at least yeah. whatever your daily ration is, breaking that up into at least two meals a day for, yep. uh, you know, working folk that can't take off at, at lunch right. and go, go, you know, feed a third meal. Um, yes you know, I, ideally we would manage a little bit better that way, but at least not, not just dumping it all at once. Yep. Small, smaller meals more often is definitely the way to go. And re I was giving a, I was doing a meeting in front of a large group of people. And a lot of times in these meetings at some, at some point when I'm making the point, smaller meals more often, I, I, I will say to the audience, yeah, like how, how many of you have time to go out and feed your horse a cup of grain every hour. And in one meeting, I had one person who raised her hand and said, I do that. And I was going, wow. 
that's that's you got a nice style of living there (laughs) so but you just you just have to realize and and again that's that's high starch grain meals right so and and again we'll get into some management practices uh one of the things even when you're feeding forage uh you want to have plenty of forage but you also want to have good quality forage because if you're just if, if unfortunately sometimes we have a bad year for hay and the hay that gets cut is really poor quality hay and in those situations um inadequate amount and quality of forage that that can be a problem and and exacerbate ulcers and this speaks right to you uh stall kept or on stall rest <laughs> that certainly increases the risk but you can manage for that. And I don't know. I told my vet that I'm going to be the one on Prozac by the time this is done. That, yeah. <laughs> that can help. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, another another management uh, type issue, not really diet, but uh, access to water. You know, good quality, clean water. You want it available all the time. You, you got to keep an eye out and make sure that the water doesn't get dirty. And in the winter, it's also helpful to have the water. There are a lot of people who feel like just they'll, they can break the ice off and, and that's going to be adequate. But quite honestly, the colder the water, when the ice water horses won't drink as much. If the water gets too hot or the water gets too cold, they tend to back off. And when they are not drinking enough, then they also tend to back off of feed. So sometimes when you've got a horse that's tending towards these issues, it's actually cheaper to use the electricity for a heated bucket, stock tank heater, some way to keep the water at, you know, it doesn't have to be room temperature, but you know, if you can keep the water like 45 to 55 degrees, they're going to drink normally and have adequate hydration. So that's something a lot of times people don't think about. Um, Using electrolytes, uh, paste electrolytes or um, the electro, you know, adding electrolytes in your water, that can exacerbate gastric ulcers. And if you think about it, that's basically salt on an open wound. So something to think about when, when you do want, if your horse is working and sweating, uh, hardworking horses just flat don't eat, they don't get enough sodium chloride. They don't get enough salt from their feed and their hay in most normal situations. Now, if your horse is doing nothing, you can put out a salt block. It's probably not going to, they're not going to have any problem. But if you have a working horse and you need electrolytes, then it tends to be a better deal to add the electrolytes into the feed. So especially you're not getting electrolytes into a a highly acidic stomach. And then one of the big ones that that veterinarians are very aware of is using NSAIDs. You know, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory such as bute over a period of time that can certainly increase, greatly increase your risk of gastric ulcers. So I know a lot of vets now, if you've got a horse um, that needs butte, uh, unfortunately, a couple of my clients uh, right now have horses that were recently diagnosed with kissing spines. And so they each went through a week of butte and our veterinarian along with the butte, you know, gave them ulcer guard. So they got the butte and the ulcer guard to try to protect the, you know, the stomach from developing ulcers from the butte. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I think all that is, uh, when you know better, you do better, you know, adding, right. adding ulcer guard or adding a pre or a probiotic when you're on antibiotics, you know, just, um, and kind of like when you started talking about this today, just, we know about ulcers because we have the technology to know about ulcers now that we didn't right. have, you know, a number of years ago. So it's, um, yeah, it's uh, it's a no. When you when we when we know better, we should we should do better. Absolutely, yeah. And I think back to when I was a kid and had my barrel horse, and the 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 state of the horse industry, we didn't know nearly as much. And I was a kid; I didn't know anything. 
And boy, taking care of horses was so easy when I knew nothing. And now, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now it's a whole lot more complicated. And I know I see memes on social media that are so true. You know, your horse, your horse has a veterinarian and a nutritionist and a massage therapist and a chiropractor and a saddle fitter. And you're going, and I hurt all the time and I don't have all these things because I'm spending all my money on taking care of my horse. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, oh, well. So once we figured out all the risk factors and we've looked at um, recognizing uh, symptoms of potential gastric ulcers and you, you have the vet out and diagnose the gastric ulcers, how do you treat the gastric ulcers? Well, the first thing, as I said before, the only, the only way to truly diagnose gastric ulcers is to have the vet scope and take a look. And then the treatments are prescription. There are medications from your veterinarian that do treat and can cure gastric ulcers. Uh, the, the common ones would be Gastrogard, um, which is the, the drug omeprazole, or sucrophate, which is another drug that helps coat lesions in the horse's stomach. And of course, those, those need to, you, you need to work with your veterinarian on the appropriate treatment for actually addressing the gastric ulcers. And when you do get treatment from your vet, make sure you follow the directions. Because for instance, with, with the, the drug treatments, if you don't give the right doses and follow your, your veterinarian's recommendations, there can be a rebound effect afterwards. So you really, you gotta work with your vet and make sure you're treating the gastric ulcers. But then once you've gone through that, you want to manage so that you can reduce the risk of having to come back and treat the gastric ulcers again. And notice I said manage the risk because you cannot eliminate the risks there. Yeah. I would love to be able to say, this is how you never deal with gastric ulcers again. And the, this is my answer for how to never deal with equine gastric ulcers don't own a horse. <laughs> yes. Yes. So <laughs> this is like anything else with horses. It's managing a moving target. It um, absolutely is. You know, and that's, and that's why we're having this conversation today because I, you know, every nothing, uh, or, or for me, nothing that you've said, I've been like, Oh, but then I'm like, Oh, I needed to hear all this again to where I am in my management practices for, for things that, that I, I can alter and, and change. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So, so some, what are some of the things you can do? Well, first off, you know, uh, look at how you're managing the horses, look at the risk factors and address as much as you can to eliminate risk factors. If you've got horses that are, that are separate from other horses and stressed about that, can you put the horses together? It's if, if a horse can be with a buddy, that's better than being by itself. Some horses can't be with other horses because they're just too aggressive. But in that case, at least if they can see other horses and you know, maybe they can't physically interact, that, if they can physically interact, that's the best. But if they can't, if they can see them and they, they realize they're not the only horse in the world, that can reduce the risk of gastric ulcers because it helps minimize the stress. Uh, so, Providing a peaceful environment for the horses. Uh, I was I was born. Horses do tend to get used to you know a lot going on, but the horses that are living in a very hectic environment do tend to be more prone to gastric ulcers because they're having to deal with that stress. You know the the happiest horses seem to be the horses that are living out in the pasture. And the human interaction is primarily come out and feed me and groom me and then and love on me and then let me hang with my buddies. Of course, in reality, that's not usually why we have horses. So you want to provide as much turnout as you can and then think about your work schedule. If the horse has been off of work, 
bring them back into work gradually, try to get them on routine. Horses do the best when things are as consistent as possible. Now, if you're showing horses and traveling with horses, even then try to make things consistent as much as you can. Uh, I had a friend who managed a polo string for a, a, a professional polo player and that string of horses traveled a whole, you know, all the time they were on the road, but she kept, like when she, when, when the horses went in the trailer, they always went in, in the same order. They were always next to the same horses when they were, um, when they were put in stalls, they always were in the same horse, in the same order of stalls. So just as much as you can keep things consistent, don't, don't change the feed. When, when you go on the road, you might have to increase if the horse is you know, working harder, but try to keep the feeding times fairly consistent. Try to keep forage in front of them as much as possible. Try to keep hay in, you know, available, water available to them as much as possible. So consistency can really help a lot with these horses. For some horses, for instance, if they're stuck on stall rest, maybe provide some enrichment opportunities to give them something to do in the stall. If you've got a horse that likes playing with a jolly ball or just, you know, hang in some milk jugs from the stall. I've tried that with my horses and they just look at me like, why are you hanging stuff in my stall? But I, I did that and then they all came down in the last well, yeah. jug came down and he stomped it in the middle of it. So it looks like he just punched it. <laughs> he was like, take that. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. <laughs> I was like, yay, Charlie. <laughs> Man. Oh, they're they're fun. <laughs> they come up with all sorts of things. <laughs> so let's see. Um if you need electrolytes, we talked about the risk factor of electrolytes. So when you need electrolytes, um try not to use paste or, or electrolytes in the water. Better way is to use electrolytes in the feed. There, there are some electrolyte supplements available that um, actually are coated electrolytes that the coating helps the, the electrolytes go through the upper gut undigested and will go through the stomach and then they're not absorbed into the small intestine so for horses with gastric ulcers, that might be a solution, but, or just electrolytes in the feed also is, is a good way to go. Parasite control, that is something that is, is very important to keep the gut, and, you know, you don't want a parasite load and there are some parasites that can, you know, wreak havoc in the, in the stomach. So you do want to keep your horse on a good deworming program. And of course, that's another thing. Work with the veterinarian now because there are specific recommendations by AAEP on good parasite control programs. Uh, work with your vet if you, if you need to give NSAIDs. If you've got to give butte to your horse, work with your vet to make sure that you've got the best way to handle the NSAIDs in, for your horse. If your horse is on stall rest, or has to be in a stall a lot, then let's say for instance, you've got an easy keeper in a stall and I've just said, you know, provide forage as much as possible. So there's something going in through their stomach all the time. Okay, you got an easy keeper. You don't wanna just keep throwing more hay at them because they're gonna get fat on hay. So a slow feeder hay net or just, there, there's all sorts of different interesting ways to slow feed hay to horses now. There are actually ways, even horses that are out on pasture on round bales, there are slow feed round bale feeders available. So if you've got horses that tend to just eat and eat their hay, either get overweight or just, you know, you want the hay to last longer, that's, that's a real good way to go. So that's a manage, those are all management situations. So uh, diet, because of course the diet can contribute to reduce risk or just exacerbate gastric ulcers. So you got a horse, you know that ulcers are, can be an issue. What do you feed them? Well, we already talked about smaller meals more often. And we talked about forage as much as possible. And 
and if the horse overdoes the forage, the the slow feed or uh, slow feed hay nets, slow feed forage containers. Uh, basically, in diets, don't have long periods of fasting. Try not to ever go beyond six hours of fasting. And the less fasting there is, the less chance that the stomach is going to become overly acidic. Uh, frequent access to good quality hair, hair pasture. Alfalfa has actually been shown to have a buffering effect on the acid. And they don't really know at this point, alfalfa is, is high calcium and that calcium can have a buffering effect. Alfalfa also tends to be very high protein and the protein can have a buffering effect. But in any case, alfalfa can help buffer the acid in the stomach. Uh, again, small meals more often, if possible, three to six meals a day. If you've got a horse that's in a stall, as much as you can divide up in the day, the better for the horse continuous access to water, and then what types of feeds. There are, you don't wanna go, if you've got gastric ulcers, try to stay away from traditionally sweet feeds. High grains, high molasses, that's probably not what you want to feed a horse that actively has gastric ulcers. Uh, there are a lot of pelleted feeds now that have controlled starch and sugar. You don't have to go just wild and say, I can't have any starch and sugar in the diet because that's not healthy for the horse. But corn tends to be very, well, corn is very high in starch. So you don't want a whole lot of corn in the horse's diet. Corn is, uh, runs about 70% soluble carbs. Uh, oats are down around 50% soluble carbs. Commercially based, commercially prepared sweet feeds actually are lower than that. They're usually um, anywhere from 30 to mid 40%, which compared to straight grains, people get really scared of sweet feeds, but you can get a sweet feed, a corn, oats, molasses, and usually a, some sort of base pellet that, that is quite a bit lower in soluble carbs. And then the pelleted feeds can go all the way down to 10% soluble carbs, which for a performance horse, that's probably a little low. Uh, but, you know, if you're in the teens or into the 20s in soluble carbs, those would be appropriate for horses with gastric ulcers. And then, of course, there are supplements. There, there, are not, there aren't supplements that are going to cure gastric ulcers. Again, that's going to be prescription medication through your veterinarian. But there are supplements that can help buffer the acid in the stomach. And there are some, some supplements that actually can even make it to the hindgut and help buffer and even help coat. So of course, I need to uh, mention the KER supplements because as we talked about earlier, KER does research on the products before the, they are ever you know, released to the market. So you know when you get a KER supplement, it has been proven to have efficacy for the horse. And so uh, the, the, the first go-tos on supplements for horses with gastric ulcers, uh, the first one would be Right Track. So Right Track has uh, antacids, has several different an antacids that help buffer the horse's stomach. And then it also helps, it, it, it has uh, compounds in it that help to coat the stomach as well. So right track is a, is, a, is a really good way to go to help address this horse when you're wanting to reduce the risk of gastric ulcers. And then the other supplement, the right track is a powder and sometimes, you, so you wanna add it to some feed. And if it's a dry feed, you might wanna add a little bit of water so that the powder will stick to the feed. And every now and then there's a horse that doesn't, doesn't wanna eat the, the powder. So another one that is designed for digestive health to help with ulcers and also it, it helps with young growing horse, it has a very bioavailable source of calcium is Equisure. So Equisure uh, doesn't have the array of antacids that Right Track does, but it does have a very potent uh, buffering agent. And it also helps in, in, with the hindgut and it's, it's in a form that sometimes is a little more palatable for horses. 
The other thing I want to say with these supplements too, they're, they're designed to be fed uh, top dressed in the feed, but you can also feed the supplements to buffer the, the stomach when you know you're going into a period that the horse is going to be stressed or a period that you know the horse is going to be uh, just a highly acidic stomach. So for instance, if you're going to haul, if you're going to be putting your horse on the trailer and the horse is a nervous horse in the trailer, uh, give them, give them, a, a, you know, a little bit of feed with one of the, one of these supplements in the feed, give them a, a, a full amount of the supplement before they get on the trailer. And then you're going to get at least a few, a few to, you know, two to four hours of good buffering in the stomach. And, and help reduce the risk then of the stomach being highly acidic and causing gastric ulcers. Uh, when you go to a show and you, you, you're getting ready for your ride or your run, maybe 30 minutes before, give them a, you know, not a big meal because you don't want to have a whole bunch of feed in the stomach at that point, but give them just enough of, of the feed with the supplement so they get a dose of supplement again before you know they're gonna be stressed and they're going to be at high risk of, they can develop ulcers really quickly, unfortunately. So as much as you can do to reduce the risk, the better off your horse is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you, um, it tends to be on the wives' tail end of things. Um, what about aloe vera juice with ulcers? Because I, I've not seen a lot in the literature that really sustains it, but, yeah. but boy, howdy, um, does that at least get <laughs> passed around <laughs> my circle it's, a lot? There's, there's not a lot of good controlled peer reviewed research <laughs> on the efficacy of aloe vera for, for horses with gastric ulcers. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say there's, there's, there's some good research. Like I said, KER's got research on their supplements. There's good research on alfalfa for its buffering effect. There are a lot of supplements out there. And if, if you go and start looking, look for the research. Look for the, 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 the proven efficacy that these supplements are actually doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, you know, and... and and that's what's great about uh, Kentucky Equine Research. I have I know several friends that have used the Equisure over, over the years um, for their horses and, and multiple other ones. And, and that, that's, again, why we're, we're doing all this today is to, to yeah. talk about the science of it. Um, well, and I, I, forgot, I forgot one more of the, the big ones from KER is uh, Triactone. Triactin is, is a little bit newer and it's, it's got, uh, it has gastric support, hindgut support and bone support all in one. So that is another one that tends to be pretty palatable. And so that's all, all three of those can be used in situations. And if, if, if anybody wants to go to the KER website or call in and talk to one of the, we've got, we've got several people whose jobs are to work with customers and make sure that they are on the right feeding programs and on the right supplements. So all those three all have, again, great research behind them. And I would highly, highly recommend them. I, I think that's a little known thing about Kentucky Equine Research is that um, there is a availability to consult on your whole program with absolutely with people who know the science behind it and and are very well versed not in their own products but across across the board yeah. of, of products um, to help you and and that's what makes that different from just going to you know Sally Sue at the barrel race mm -hmm. you know with all yes. these supplements, they, she doesn't know what your horse needs because we're, we're, they only talk about what that product does instead of um, getting enveloped into what your program is and what your specific horse's needs are. Right, and, and this is a nice thing. It's a really easy website to navigate and go on and contact somebody at KER. And the, 
I like that it's an easy website to remember. It's ker.com. <laughs> so, yeah, can't get any easier than that. <laughs> yeah, even even I can remember that one. <laughs> oh, Dr. Young, thank you so much for taking time today to, I, I just think this has been a great conversation going uh, all things gastric ulcers. It, it's just been wonderful. Oh, you're so welcome. I, I've... I, I love, you know, my, I got into, I became an equine nutritionist because it is so rewarding to help people help their horses. And when somebody comes back and says, you know, I, I tried what you recommended and it worked, that's, that's just the best. So that I appreciate you, you asking me to talk and I am more than happy to participate. Awesome. So thank awesome. you. Yeah, don't tip me with a good time. We'll we'll do a hind gut <laughs> we'll do a hind gut ulcer conversation here in the future. Hey, that works. And then goes just go down the list. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you for coming on today, and thank you guys for continuing to listen and to help push this podcast forward. You know how much I enjoy bringing quality conversations to help in horse and rider fitness and health. And as always, I will see you down the road. Thank you for listening to Rider's Edge podcast. For show notes and other thoughts, head over to ridersedgetherapy.com. If you would like to stay connected and continue the conversation, head over to my free Facebook group, Rider's Edge Health and Wellness for Horse and Rider. Thanks for continuing the conversation, and as always, I will see you down the road.